You are now tuned in to the Project 365 Experience. Welcome back, guys, to the Project 365 Podcast um, Special Edition. We are in an amazing time for basketball fans. The Olympics are here, and with my good friend Jose, we're going to break down some games. Jose, how are we talking? How are we feeling? Olympics? Um, talk to me. Uh, you waited a long time for this. Talk to me. How are we feeling? It's, it's time to sing Oh Canada. It's, t- it's time <laughs> to sing Oh Canada. Uh, however, if we do have uh, international, non-Canadian uh, listeners, we, we, we should respect them and not sing Oh Canada on this uh, exact podcast. But the Olympics, I mean, it, uh, forget exciting. Like, it's just, it's a different brand of basketball going from compared to the NBA to FIBA. And those differences lead to a lot of, for me, learning curve about the game. And it, it, it's like a different mental uh, exercise, uh, thinking about strategies and how players fit together. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's been, ex- it was, I anticipated this field to be as one of the most exciting Olympics ever. And so far it has delivered. No question. This is, I don't know um, what you think, but this is potentially one of the most, in terms of like talent, like across the board, um, every country just being able to be kind of like have, you know, uh, players that they could look to look towards. This is kind of like up there. This is up there in terms of competition and uh, um, talent. I don't have the stats with me, but I would be shocked if this was not one top two, top three tournaments with the most current and ex NBA players in it. Mm. I, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't the case. Um, I think the exhibition games, uh, some of the scores and results reflected that, the level of competitiveness of every team. Uh, just And I think just by the fact that if you look at the field, I think you can make a legitimate case for at least eight teams thinking to themselves, we need to win a medal, otherwise we're going to be disappointed. And that many teams for the Olympics, not the World Cup, the Olympics, that is really impressive. And it's really exciting for us basketball fans. Absolutely. Um, we have a really uh, great show, fun show for you guys. Um, we separated this into a couple of sections that we think uh, is going to provide a lot of value to our listeners. So um, the first thing we're going to be looking at is going to be um, the differences that we uh, were able to notice from FIBA versus NBA. Um, afterwards, we're going to kind of do a little power ranking in terms of the teams that are in this tournament. Um, we're going to look at um, at the time of this recording, we uh, have just finished um, uh, the second day of the Olympics, right? So I think two groups have played. Uh, we have one uh, more three. group that is all three. Group. Three groups. All three, all three all groups three. have played. Yep, all three groups have played. So um, after day one of competition for these teams, um, we're going to look at a couple of things that um, uh, we we're going to look at a couple of scores, and we're going to look at a couple of things that stood out in these things, and. Um, a little bonus sections, um, whichever team is at the top of the power rankings, we're going to look at um, what is the threat to this, to this team. So stay tuned for this one. Um, but, yeah, so it's definitely a different kind of game. You're looking at Olympics-wise and all that kind of stuff. So um, what is one of the um, things that you think uh, in terms of difference from FIBA to NBA as you're watching these games that stands out to you? There's a lot of rules uh, that are different between the FIBA game and the NBA game. But for the purpose of this podcast, we'll focus only on four. And the first one I want to highlight is the goaltending rule. So in the NBA, goaltending essentially is any time that there is a rebound opportunity, a shot that is, or, or a, a shot where the ball is coming off the rim or hanging around the rim. Uh, you can't touch it. If you do, it's considered a goaltending. And that's two points for the offensive team. In the FIBA game, uh, anytime there is a rebounding opportunity where the ball is hanging around the cylinder after the initial shot attempt, you have the ability as the defensive player to knock it off the, the rim, and hence creating a, a defensive rebound and preventing a score. And that is a huge difference from a, a team philosophy standpoint, right? Like if you're a team that crashes the offensive rebound, that's a lot more aggressive. You're, you're allowed a lot more aggressiveness, and it makes it a lot harder for a defensive team to corral rebounds because now you're not just battling from a physical position. You're, this is literally hand-to-hand combat trying to knock the ball in the, in the basket or out the rim. Uh, so that difference to me is, is, uh, is absolutely massive and needs to be highlighted. 
Absolutely. I'll go into um, my second one that I think um, for the sake of this uh, section, um, you know, you and I, and I'll give you a bit of time to talk about this, but just it's, it's apparent that the defensive three um, seconds uh, is a big, big, big factor. Um, just players having the ability to, um, it, you know, it's, it's almost like it, it's not almost. It's non-existent in the FIBA game where you have a player like uh, Victor Wembanyama that's able to just stay in the paint and deter every shot. Um, going towards the rim um, and you were able to see it in a couple of uh, certain games like certain players are actually taking advantage of this role as they should you know if you're a big and now in the FIBA game you are allowed to stay in the paint in near the restricted area and not have to in NBA terms 2-9 which is spend three 2.9 seconds step out and step back in it makes it a lot easier to defend the rim it makes it permanently possible to play zone defense and in theory, it should increase your rebounding efficiency from a defensive team standpoint. So it's a huge, huge rule uh, change versus the NBA. Absolutely. Um, something else that we're seeing, um, just in terms of time, you're seeing the rotation. Some of these NBA players are used to, you know, maybe getting extended rest or playing longer and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, instead of uh, 48 minutes, uh, four 12-minute quarters um, in the NBA, um, you're looking at uh, the FIBA game having 40 minutes. Um, just in terms of rotation, playing style, how much of a difference does this make? Oh, it's massive, all right? Like, if you're trying to uh, play a deeper rotation, you just have less time and less opportunities uh, to use uh, your full rotation, right? I, I think, you know, jumping ahead a little bit here, but the USA faced a situation where uh, they had a couple of players not play at all because... Part of it was with the flow of the game. Uh, when you're eight, when you're midway through the fourth quarter, you've already given up six minutes, two minutes per quarter in quarter one and two and three, and then there's one minute less that you have for the fourth quarter. So that's seven minutes times five positions. That's 35 minutes of playing time that usually you would have distributed somehow. That's not available, right? And from a uh, managing your lineups present. Uh, uh, from the sorry, from the point of view to manage of managing your lineups, managing energy, managing timeouts, it just changes everything. And obviously, um, as an offensive player, you have less time and less opportunities to score. Absolutely. Um, another one that we um, decided to highlight for the fans looking at it. If you're looking at your screen and you're wondering, hey, is the court smaller? Does it look smaller? Indeed, it is smaller, all right? The FIBA court um, is smaller than uh, an NBA court. Um, Jose got the dimensions on this? Yeah, so uh, the the NBA court is uh, longer by two feet and wider by one feet. So when you, you, overall, you're just saying, okay, Jose, it's two square feet of this, of, of, uh, of spacing that we're talking about. It can't be that different. When... You're talking about 12-year-old kids, 10-year-old kids. Yeah, no, it's not that different. But when you're talking about grown men, and most of them are over 6'8", and they need room to move and operate, that one dribble drives a lot different, starting from top of the key, when the, the, the guy at the elbow and at the nail is a lot closer than he was in the NBA game. The spacing in the corners, especially in the corners at the 45, now you have less room to space out the court if you're trying to run a one four flat pick and roll. If you're trying to run some screening action at top of the key, if you're trying to, you know, run some five out action where you know the paint is open for cutters to run through. I mean, you can be five out and leave the paint open, but if there's less room in the paint that is open, it's a lot harder to negotiate and execute from an offensive standpoint. So that's a, a very big deal uh, that needs to be uh, need to be acknowledged. And it's interesting because like you're looking at how. We talked about these four rules, and then, like, they kind of, like, all compound with each other, and I find it very interesting. So you're looking at how the shorter court affects, but now you add on top of that, you can have a seven-footer in the middle of the paint, right? So you're, you're just seeing, like, visually, there's certain things that you probably, as an NBA player, you're not used to doing, right? You're, you're seeing more bodies, and, you know, for the... For the people that have been watching the games at home, I'm sure you're wondering why there's less dunks going to the basket. Well, that means that we have people at the rim and the paint is always like protected, right? So that's also something very interesting to to keep an eye out from. Um, 
And and to transition kind of into the actual gameplay, pre-tournament, we had a couple of ideas about how the teams were going to match up. So, Josue, um, take it away. We're going to go to our power rankings, um, what we thought going into um, the Olympics. Um, and then after, we'll talk about um, how adjustments or whatever after a couple after two days of competition so it's a great transition when you were mentioning nba players aren't used to this because in the power rankings that i've made and when i was thinking about doing the mental exercise of how do i think each team matches up and from a expectation internal expectation standpoint what each team should expect what you find out very quickly is that it's not because you have nba players that you're guaranteed success in fact Mm -hmm. Because the FIBA game is so different, FIBA experience is almost just as valuable and evens out the playing field uh, with just bringing on the best NBA players, uh, let alone coaching, let alone chemistry, let alone uh, have, having some, uh, spent time together from an external standpoint. But uh, without further ado, I will start with uh, the bottom of my power ranking. So I had five tiers. Uh, we're looking at the 12 teams. Uh, of this uh, tournament and the reason we're going to start with power rank is because the tournament format that we'll go into it's not necessarily uh conducive to just think about uh to doing the exercise ahead of time because uh, the way the the tournament works it's too hard to predict but what you can do is you can assess each team uh, for their strength prior to the tournament so i want to highlight i did this before the game started so i this is what i was thinking going into the competition so in tier five I had Japan, who have one NBA player and one ex-NBA player. In Tier 4, I had Brazil, who have zero current NBA players, but six previous NBA players. I had South Sudan, who have zero current NBA players, but four ex-NBA players. And Puerto Rico, who have one current NBA player and four uh, previous uh, ones. So every team, each team during, uh, within a tier, you could... Uh, order them in a, in a different order I wouldn't really see any uh, problem with that uh, but uh, for when I determined started that's how I saw tier 4 in tier 3 I had Germany uh, who have 4 current NBA players 1 previous one I had Canada who have 11 NBA uh, current NBA players 0 previous ones I had Spain who have 1 current NBA players 6 previous ones I had Australia who have 8 current NBA players two previous ones and i had greece who have one current nba player and three guys who used to play in the nba in tier two i had serbia who have four current nba players and two uh previous uh two guys who previously played in the league and i had france uh the host who had four current nba players and five guys who used to play in the nba and finally, in Tier 1, as most people expected, I had Team USA, who have 12, all 12 guys who currently play in the NBA. So again, I had five tiers. Those were, a tier, those were the teams uh, that I had grouped within those different tiers. And I see each team, with uh, all the teams within a tier, as interchangeable. So if they're at the, bo- the bottom of the tier, top of the tier, it's a matter of preferences. What are your thoughts when you... Uh, first hear my rankings at this time definitely so um one thing that definitely stands out is um you're looking at for instance canada being the second team with the most nba players um i just want in terms of how you ranked and just your process of it um what was the thought process going into it to put them in that tier three with players with um teams that have um a good amount of nba experience but maybe not as much right in uh, tier three so the strength of the group uh, in which they are uh, really factored in uh, my analysis so simply saying that uh, with being paired with spain australia and greece it was going to be quite difficult to uh, win the group not impossible but difficult and if that wasn't the case then the pathway through the quarterfinals was going to be set up to be very difficult and even if they do win the group it could still be very very difficult in addition I really like the roster. As a Canadian, this is the most excited I've ever been at the Olympics. Uh, we've never been to the Olympics in my time yeah. <laughs> as, an, as a basketball fan. Like in 2000, mm. I didn't really care about basketball at the time. So I'm beyond excited. But I am concerned about the lack of size. And as much as I'm absolutely excited to watch Shea Gilgis-Alexander do his thing 
and uh, continue to excel in shot creation scenarios, just like he did in the World Cup last summer. I'm just concerned as the tournament goes on, and if we do end up matching up in the quarters or the semifinals against a France team, a Serbia team, a Team USA, are we potentially too easy to guard and too easy to game plan against not by a lack of knowledge I'm not this is not me saying coach Jordi uh, Fernandez is not good enough that's not in quite the opposite in fact I'm quite confident in his coaching staff but it's more about the roster composition just like the 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 uh, the, la main <laughs> the, yeah, the players yeah. that are at play, right? The, 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 the Team Canada, uh, Team Canada roster, and just from an X and O standpoint, looking at what those teams have uh, to be able to operate. One, they're mostly bigger across the board, uh, and two, they have a guy that had in a one-on-one matchup in, in, in a one-game scenario can be the best player on the court. So that kind of evens up the one big advantage that we have, which is Shea Gilgeous Alexander being so excellent. Mm-hmm. And even in terms of like who they have on their rotation, right? Like, I think it, it'll be interesting to see um, because you also have an opportunity to um, play around with the rotations differently. Like right? you and I were talking about this beforehand. Um, this is a team that may like have more depth than what they'd had in their World Cup run last year, right? So sure. the potential is there, but. How much do you think it is a luxury to maybe have other players that can kind of step in and relieve pressure off of... We know that Che Gillis Alexander is going to be at the top of every scouting report. How much luxury is it to have other players that can kind of step in and take some load off of him? Let me clarify something. I put Germany, Canada, Spain, Australia, and Greece in my Tier 3. I think all five of these teams Mm -hmm. can make the finals, like access the... Olympic final and give USA a heck of a hard time if not, if Team USA is not careful, win the game outright. Like I want to make that clear. Part of it, for, from a Team Canada standpoint, is that depth you're talking about. There are so many different options, possibilities, matchup uh, uh, answers from a coaching staff standpoint. Unfortunately, some of those players are a little repetitive in a sense that they not necessarily augment the strength of each other, but they are very good replacement of each other. It's like, for example, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but there was a scenario where uh, Lou Dort uh, was in foul trouble. And even though I'm not sure he had the best game or the best outing, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, his profile is very similar to what Lou Dort is. He is obviously a lot thinner. He's not as physical. You could argue, I don't think he's as long, but he's an on-ball point-of-attack defender, and in on the offensive hand, he is his role is to spot up and shoot threes. So if Lou is in foul trouble, or you know, he, if there's a, a, a twisted ankle, he can't go in for possession. In theory, Nikhil Alexander Walker can walk in and do the same role. And there's a lot of situations like that all over the roster, and that is good. Like that's not a bad thing. The only thing is that if you walk into a matchup where okay, this team has just a ton of size and you need to answer the size question, then I don't know that we have all those matchups that make sense. The same way if we play a team that has really big wings, like we have a really a, a lot of really good guards, and then we have competent bigs, but I'm not sure that we have the answers for the big wings. And big wings is really Team USA when you, when you think about it, right? So it, there is a lot of good answers to the test, but there's not answers to every test. And that's why the Olympics is so hard to win. Like This, this idea that as Team USA, or because we're Team USA, we're just going to walk in there and be fine. No, it's, it's not how it works. That's absolutely not how it works. You know, and to, to, to further on that point, I found a key, like an interesting, an interesting stat. Um, RJ, um, RJ Barrett, right? After, um, so Canada won their opening game against uh, Germany. We'll get uh, against Germany, against Greece. Uh, we'll get to that. But just talking about the impact of having, like, a load of, like, extra players that they could go to. Um, after that game, when RJ scores 15 points, uh, Canada is 7-1 and one since last year uh, in the, um, the, um, the World Cup run. So, again, going back to that depth is something that could be very interesting. I believe um, it. I believe it. Yeah. 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 Um, 
Tier 2. Uh, talk to me a bit about Tier 2. Uh, Serbia, France, um, what makes these two teams Tier 2? Um, I'm not... I'm, I'm going to take a guess that there are big factors in there that make them Tier 2, please. B- b- big is like a big clue. <laughs> Well, well done. Give you nice, nice play on words there. I mean, Nikola Jokic plays for Serbia. Victor Banyama plays for France. Okay, it's a team effort here, right? And I think, you know, jumping ahead a little bit, I think Team Greece showed that having the best player in the game doesn't necessarily guarantee you to win. You need a complement of players. You need a depth on the team to uh, be able to close out a game, uh, especially. But what those two teams have on top of having a guy that can be the best player in any given game in this tournament, they have depth. And in Serbia's case, they have experience. Like FIBA, European, high-level experience in Eurobaskets, in the World Cup. And with this group of players for the last like five years, they've all had some level of experience um, in, a let's say, a competition of this level. Because I do consider the World Cup and Eurobasket to be on the level of the Olympics from a quality of play. Some would even say Eurobasket is better than the Olympics just because you have more quality teams. Um, so that Serbia, that's why. And in France, I mean, the other part that you got to mention, they're the host. So from a home crowd standpoint, mm. like anybody that watched game one that they played against Brazil, like a little extra juice for, for that game than, than the other game. So uh, that is, that's a massive factor from, uh, you know, guys just being able to, We've seen this throughout the history of the Olympics. You know, the team, the, the country that's at home, everybody has 10% more energy, 10% more effort, 10% je ne sais quoi, to say that in the, to honor the French. So, uh, I, the, the, to me, that, that had to be a factor you had to, uh, you had to account for. Yeah. I, I like how you said that. Je ne sais quoi. I think that's exactly. Uh, the 10% exactly is so is. accurate. Like, there's just a 10% going, you know? Uh, Um, guys who win things are never supposed to win or guys that do things they've never career highs that happen just because the adrenaline, the, the passion, like they just feel like transported by the crowd. We've seen that through sports and uh, throughout history. So you have to account for that. Yeah. Um, we, we were talking, um, we were talking at the beginning and um, just what kind of impact can Jokic do at this level? I mean, his game definitely translates, right? Like, he, we're talking about dribble pass shoots, uh, incredibly intelligent. Um, the fact that he has less ground to cover with a shorter court is very good because now from a mm-hmm. pick and roll defensive standpoint, it makes it easier for him. Uh, the only issue he's gonna, the team is going to run into is how do they perform when he's on the bench? Uh, because as good as he is, for, for his role, what he does and what he means to that team, they don't necessarily have the greatest... Uh, rep- they don't have um, not the greatest replacement, but somebody that can fill in those bench minutes adequately without the team getting trounced. Uh, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But the good news for them is that Team USA is in their pool, which means as long as they access the quarters, they won't see them until the finals. That's good. Mm. Be- in, in, <laughs> think in your mind, because think about it. From if I'm Team Serbia, I get a, I get, go, I get to go against them once, so we get to we get to see how try. Matchups, try things, eva- you know, evaluate the personnel, adjust their scouting report, and then if we take care of the of the next two games and we access the quarterfinals, and from that point on we do what we're supposed to do. If we see them again, oh, we've had practice. Now we're confident. Now we're thinking like, oh, okay, like maybe you know, whatever happens, game one, oh, we we get to see them again. Like this this is good for us. So uh, uh, in addition to having played them in the exhibition, <laughs> that's definitely. Um... Uh, one thing I want to look at is tier three, uh, Germany, right? Um, World Cup winners uh, in 2023. Um, talk to me. Um, why are they not yet at that level of, you would say, a Serbia of a, or a France, right? We know Dennis the Menace definitely is something else in FIBA play, right? So um, just talk to me a little bit about uh, Germany. Yeah, Dennis Schroeder, I mean, uh, Terrific player when it comes to FIBA play. I mean, he, he showed it at the World Cup. Uh, he showed it at the other uh, at the other Eurobasket tournaments before. Um, I think it comes down to Franz Wagner specifically uh, because, as much as the, the it's it's the same core of the team that pl- that uh, competed last summer, but in the Olympic format where uh, you don't go through the round of 16 like you did in round, uh, actually, I think you even went round 32, round 32, and then round 16. 
uh, you have less games, right? You just have less opportunities uh, to, uh, to, 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 to access the highest level. So the sample size is shorter. So that means it comes down to more, uh, let's say, predictive events and less, actually, I'm, uh, pro- yeah, I would say so. I think it's, it's less predictive events and le- um, more margin for randomness. So meaning, meaning, uh, I'll explain this. If you have the best player in the game, it gives you a good basis to operate. After that, it comes down to, okay, can we limit the amount of random things that happen in one game sample size because, quote-unquote, it's basketball. Like, sometimes things happen in the course of a basketball game that you just you can't explain other than by saying it's basketball. Example, ball goes out of bounds, refs makes a bad call, a player that shoots 15% from three makes three threes. Like, it's not a seven-game series. So random events, like, they change the game, like, that's it. Like, you know, it's a one-game sample size. So basically, Franz Wagner has to be the best player for three games in a row, starting with maybe the last group game, group play game, the quarters and the semis for Germany to access the highest level. Either him or Dennis Schroeder. Is it possible? Yes. At this point, I would personally say it's unlikely. So that's why at this mm. time I have him in tier three. But again, this is this is the World Cup winners. This is not just some. Uh, some team assembled with some players who don't have that chemistry, that belief, um, and that experience from a coaching staff standpoint. It just comes down to comparing to the rest of the competition in this format, in the Olympic format versus a World Cup format or a Eurobasket format. I like it. Um, anybody from that Tier 4 or Tier 5 that you know either you really enjoy watching or you think potentially can um, catch you lacking on, on a bad day, uh, playing Brazil is always complicated. Uh, they scratch, claw uh, as many as many illegal things as they can get away with. Uh, it's just a part of the Brazilian basketball ethos. Uh, I love the South Sudan story. I don't think I'm the only one in that. Uh, you know that Luol Deng essentially has started the program. It's his operation, his initiative, and that so many players uh, that are either first generation or second generation. Um, sorry, born and bred or first generation um, uh, South Sudanese have flocked to the program and uh, really tried to develop a culture and put it on the map. They started at the World Cup last summer, they're qualifying for the Olympics and now performing in the Olympics. I think it's fantastic. And then Puerto Rico, uh, quite frankly, just winning their group outright and the scenes that were because they were hosting the Olympic qualifier and the scenes coming out of that and the the support that you saw at home, I think is, I think is awesome. That's what the Olympics uh, are the Olympics. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we had the luxury of seeing like everybody, uh, after their first games. Um, do you want to kind of run through a couple of, uh, scores or a couple of things that we saw in day one for these teams? Yeah. Let me, uh, let me uh, state the scores. Uh, at this time we are, uh, uh, after uh, we're done um, one game in each group. Uh, so there are three groups of four teams um, that mentioned the Olympic format. So essentially the top two teams uh, throughout all three groups uh, will be seated one and two. Uh, the seventh and eighth team, there is some point differential head-to-head records that will come into play, but the top eight teams advance to the core finals. One and two are, are seated on one side, seven and eight are seated on another side, and then there is a draw uh, between 1, 2, 7, and 8, and a draw between 3, 4, 5, and 6. So it's important to perform in your group, but it, it's hard to know just looking at, like, it, it's not the world, the soccer World Cup you could see, like, crossover ahead of time. Like, it, mm-hmm. You have to see the ranking 1 through 8, and then after that there's a draw. So it's very hard to predict ahead of time. But after one game in each group, uh, in Group A, Canada beat Greece 86 to 79. Australia beat Spain 92 to 80. In Group B, France beat Brazil 78 to 66, and Germany beat Japan 97 to 77. And finally, in Group C, USA beat Serbia 110 to 84, and South Sudan beat Puerto Rico 90 to 79. No, so so um, I'm kind of gonna give you like just reading through those scores. Like, is there anything? Um is there anything from day one that kind of like jumped there? Or do you want to hop into a game right away and just for us to be there? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that jump in my mind, but I think <laughs> as, as Canadians, it wouldn't make sense that if we didn't start anywhere else than by the Canada-Greece game. 
Uh, it wouldn't make sense. I agree. Here we I'm, go. I'm going to start with just saying I don't think I'm safe to be around during Canada games. I, I think I've, <laughs> I've realized that because I even surprised myself by how intense and locked in and em, uh, incredibly emotional I became during those games because every call matters. It's, that's why the Olympics are the Olympics, right? It's not a seven-game series. It's not a regular season game. Like Every, every possession truly matters. Um, especially in an Olympic format where in a group play, uh, the score, the point differential can matter when it comes to seeding. So we, we talked about the top eight teams accessing the quarterfinals, like point differential matters. So even if you win, did you win by enough? Basically is what the, it comes down to. Um, and I mean, the big takeaway from, the, from Canada Greece to me was like, well, I saw a top five player of, perform for the Canadian team and I saw another top five player perform for the Greece team because both Shea Gilgis Alexander and Giannis were incredible uh quite frankly they were the emphasis of both coaches game plans I think it was pretty evident to see but the depth of team Canada uh, showed out uh throughout the game not so much from in terms of bench performance I think I would say it was more the realization of like oh wow we have all these guys that are options and available and can give something or, or, or help in one or another aspect uh, of the game uh, before uh, she gives us and can close it out. So I agree with you. I think like for me, um, it was very eye opening that there were like so many players that could perform, but I'm thinking of one lineup in particular of Shea, Dylan, RJ, Dwight Powell, and Lou Dort. Talk to me uh, defensively. What did you see, and how <laughs> how impactful was the defense of that five? I can't say exactly how I felt because it's pretty X-rated, but I felt <laughs> really good. I felt incredibly good and incredibly confident with this lineup. And I think one of the ways you can know and see inside the mindset of a coaching staff is watch what they do in a high-leverage situation. Up one, down one, end of a quarter, uh, up, um, uh, uh, up. Uh, sorry, ahead or behind, starting a half. Uh, what do they do mm-hmm. in those situations? And it will let you know. They might tell you something in a press conference, pregame, postgame, but at the end of the day, the tape doesn't really. It doesn't lie. Now, the interpretation can be accurate and accurate, but the tape itself is not going to lie to you. In the last three minutes of the second quarter. They, Coach Jordy went to that lineup, and it was very good to close out the half uh, on both ends of the court because Ludor was 2 of 4 from 3. Uh, Dylan Brooks in the first half, I think he might have missed one shot. I don't think he missed the three. He might have missed one. Uh, and then uh, R.J. Barrett was, like, quality throughout. He's the best. Uh, I think at this point he's the best free-throw drawer in this team. I mean, I know Shea has the foul merchant reputation, but – Kind of when, come, when it comes down to it, and it's through the flow of the game, and Team Canada's looking to get some free throws and you know get a breather. I mean, RJ's kind of the best. Uh, RJ Barrett's the best option, uh, and then defensively, I mean, the one through four, uh, the versatility, the ball pressure. You could see it was a part of the game plan. It was highly effective. So now moving ahead to Game Two against Australia, I think that lineup is going to get some good burn, and uh, they're going to have. <laughs> They're gonna no. Nah, the, the, the word is burn, and they're gonna have their uh, their work cut out for them uh, because between Josh Giddy, Patty Mills, and Jock Langdale as the release valve, uh, the Australians w- had a big, big game one uh, victory in their books, considering their rivalry with Spain historically, uh, and a lot of young guys got to perform. Um, on the national stage for the first time with Team Australia performed really well, you know, especially looking at Josh Giddy, Dyson Daniels. So Team Canada's work is, is don't take the Austrians any lightly. In fact, I would take them as seriously as you can because they, they're going to yeah. look Team Canada eye to eye um, and yeah. have no fear. Absolutely none. No, absolutely. Um, just diving a little bit back into like um, that Canada Greece game, I think what I appreciated the most with it seemed like there was like. Um, the team seemed very connected on the defensive end. It seemed like everybody had their role and everything was kind of like um, flowing smoothly. You're talking about um, Lou Dort picking up uh, Nick Kalaitis, uh three-quarter court and then him just frustrating him like all the way up. You even saw, you even saw Nick pick up an offensive foul after a while, right? Early, early in, the, in the game. So that's 
that spoke to the frustration. And again, was it two or three shot clock violation that Canada oh, had? Man. That's I think that in showed the that first the first half, two in the first quarter for sure. For that's sure what I'm saying. Quarter. That's what I'm saying. So it's like it proved that it was um, destabilizing um, the Greek um, offense. Um, I think also um, something important to notice, and this is kind of like circling back to what we were talking about. Um, towards the end of this game, like three three of their starters had fouled out, right? So for them to still be able to be finish the game with um, that kind of debt that we talked about um, is very important. And also... Um, I have to give a shout out to Dylan Brooks because I think he did probably one of the best jobs on Giannis just guarding man to man. I think that I've seen in like a long time because Giannis is somebody that can um, create a lot of offense um, for his teammates. Um, that's his role for this Greek team. Um, I think Dylan did a good job at being very physical, but the scout of everybody kind of showing that wall around Giannis, um, it seemed like there was like some kind of connectivity that I really enjoyed from the Canadian side. Um, is there another game that you want to look into? I mean, I mentioned it uh, a little bit. Uh, Team Australia beating Spain. Uh, you know, they have mm -hmm. a historical rivalry with them uh, where for years and years they couldn't beat them. Uh, where was the World Cup, the Olympics, uh, exhibition, they just couldn't beat them. Until Tokyo uh, Olympics in 2021 where they did win uh, a bronze medal, and then finally, uh, that was kind of like, you know, pop the, the, the cap bottle, and then now to play them in game one, to win them in game one, and basically with a new group, because a lot of the older guys in generation, Joe Ingles, Matthew Deladova, now have a, a, a tertiary, a secondary, if not tertiary role, uh, and the fact that they were able to start the tournament so strong like that, like, that was a big, big, big telling sign for me, uh, of a team that's not just connected, but like, He's confident, uh, confident in the, the role hierarchy, confident in uh, the, the game plan, and confident in each other, like each other's ability to execute in high leverage situations. So that game really uh, got my interest. And uh, again, it's, it's FIBA plays, the Olympics. Like a lot of regular NBA fans or you know, listeners that are much more familiar with the NBA game are not, not necessarily going to understand why um, it's Jock Landale. Like... It's the big deal. This guy can he can't even be an NBA starter. When it comes to FIBA play people, it's different. It's just different. Mm. Those guys that you think are a bit players in the in again shorter uh, uh, shorter leverage situation with a clear role with clear comfort mm -hmm. and opportunity, which in the NBA doesn't come very often, but at the national team level may come. Add all of that together, and you have competitive teams. It's, sometimes it's just mm. that simple. Yeah. No, definitely. Especially going into these with some of these teams that haven't had that much time to prepare and all that kind of stuff, right? So the the familiarity with what kind of role is going to be asked of them, um, a lot of time it could manifest itself super early. And you're talking about in a tournament where every game is important. Um, it's important for you to know your role early. Um, hold, hold, on, hold, on. Into, hold, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let me point to that point because I have something really, mm -hmm. really good to emphasize what you're saying. So Canada's playing Australia the next game, right? They've both mm -hmm. won. So both of those teams are thinking to themselves, okay, we got to win this game to win the group. Greece and Spain both have lost. So they're thinking to themselves, we have to win this game to have any chance to get to the quarters. After this game, for the third game, Canada would play Spain, and then uh, Australia would be playing Greece. Let's say for sake of argument, let's say for sake of argument, that Canada wins that game, and Spain win their game. Now Spain would be 1-1, one one, Canada would be 2-0. Whoever wins, if Spain wins that game, they're both two and one. So Canada would mm. have would lose potentially lose a top two seed, and a top two seed is a lot better than being third, fourth. And now you're in a random draw, and then you might end up playing a team worthy of a one seed. And then from oh, a Spain for the Spain tiebreaker, they would that's they right would lose the tiebreaker. They would oh. lose it. Mm -hmm. potentially. Potent the Camille scores that, but potentially they could. And then from a Spain standpoint, you went from oh now we lost game one to we we could win the group. Inversely. If Australia loses that game, now they're one and one. If Greece loses the second game, now they're one and two. If Greece wins against Australia, they're one and two. Australia is also one and two. So now Greece goes from zero and two, we're out of the tournament, to one and two. A are we tiebreakers, cumulative score? Maybe we get to the quarters. Every Crazy. every game matters. When I say every game matters, this is a perfect example. One and one, one and zero. Oh, 
2-0, 0-2, it doesn't matter. You can get to the quarterfinals no matter what. There's a chance you could get to the quarterfinals. So every game does truly matter. That's insane that you pointed that out because, like, you're looking at I'm, – I'm very happy that you said that because you're looking at potentially you could lose the first two games, but based on your last matchup, you could potentially get the chance to move um, on to the next round. And also, what I found very interesting, um, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, uh, point differential matters. That's why if you're looking at the end of these games, like teams are shooting the ball at the end of these games, it's because every single point matters. That's right. It's crazy. It's it crazy. is crazy. Yeah. It surely is. Um, yeah. Um, group A is definitely um, the, you know, a lot of people have done it, the toughest group. So we're going to be looking at that one um, in particular, obviously because we have Canada in there. Um, but I'm going to dive into um, Group C right now. Um, had a game where USA... Uh, beat Serbia 110 to 84. Um, there was a nice little stat on uh, Nikola Jokic uh, that you and I shared. I don't know if you want to talk about that one. Yeah, basically that uh, Team yeah. Serbia was even when he was playing, and they were minus 29. Basically, the difference between in the game when he sat, and unfortunately, as good of a player as he is, he can't play all 40 minutes. And so, what happened was that Team USA made their run whenever he was on the bench. And whenever he would can, he'd come back in, Serbia would make it closer, and on and on until the uh, until the end of the game. And that's why Team USA is Team USA. Uh, when they are committed defensively to all max effort and offensively, not uh, not thinking about stepping on each other's toes, uh, sorry toes, but simply executing. Like whatever the play is, whatever the plays for, like read out of it. I mean, there was one. I'm just I'm gonna pick something random here. Uh, it's Steph Curry do a, run, doing a baseline cut, and Drew Holiday screening for his man, and LeBron had LeBron James had the ball up top, and he was pointing towards where Drew Holiday was, kind of distracting the opponent, and because every team in the history of basketball knows when Steph Curry is running around, like go to him. Well, get what happened? Two guys went to him. Two players, two guys went to him. Which left <laughs> Drew Holiday wide open under the basket, which is what happens when you're part of a Steph Curry offense. So when they play like that. I mean, that team's unbeatable in any way you slice it. When they play like that. Agreed. When they play like that. Agreed. Agreed. 12 NBA, 12 NBA players. Like, <laughs> you know. And then the next thing that I would probably have to point out is, man, like, um, how good was Kevin Durant in that game? Like, that was something definitely to see. Um, he uh, had 21 points in the first half only. And it was insane to see. I mean, I th what's that interview he had? I want to say like five years ago, where uh, hmm. I think it was, I think it was in the Clippers series. This would have been 2019, I think, when he was back with the Warriors. And Lou Williams yeah. and Pat Beverly were talking like, ah, he's not that good. Like, ah, we got him, hmm. we figured him out. And he, he, you know, post game, he's like, I'm Kevin Durant. Like, y'all know who I am. <laughs> You know who I, I posted out my and, story. And, and I posted out my story the, today. Yeah, exactly. Like he, he, looked, he looked at one reporter, said, I'm Kevin Durant. Do you know who I am? He looked at another one, said, do you know who I am? And they said, yeah. He's like, yeah, there you go. That's basically what that was, which is why I didn't quite understand why there seemed to be like an undercurrent of concern or panic about the Team USA offense because the whole time I'm looking around, I'm like, if KD is good at like okay-ish health-wise, like – He's the he's the antidote. Like whatever zone trap, uh, double team you want to throw at Stephen LeBron. Like the one guy that can just be like, yeah, your little defense there that's really cute is him. And in the first half, I mean, I think a lot of it off adrenaline. Uh, I don't know that he's gonna be eight for eight uh, <laughs> throughout the rest of the tournament. But you saw basically that he's he breaks your defense, like because he is that good. He's been that good internationally for Team USA now for a long time. Uh, all the way back to the 2010 World Cup, the first um, first tournament he won with Team USA at the national team level, uh, and yeah, he's been he's been that good ever since. So uh, I think again this this idea that this Team USA is beatable uh, easily, I don't think that's accurate. And a uh, big reason of that is because when all things break down, they still have an older but yet still effective Kevin Durant. Oh, that's so. This this kind of ties back perfectly into what we were talking about, which is the different tiers, right? Um, 
it's clear that when you have a player like Kevin Durant and, you know, gets minutes and provides what he's providing, um, they're head above everybody else in that tier one. Um, we're looking at um, the USA just scouting report, right? Um, obviously projected to win the gold. Um, they're the only team with all NBA players right now. Um, obviously, there's a lot of debate about um, if healthy, um, who are they going to have? But having the luxury of having all these players, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good problem to have if everybody buys in, right? Um, I think... Yeah, I put this in my I put this in my note. That was something that I was looking forward to. Like, so we just talked talked about it a little bit, but I was happy to see KD approach the game the way that he did, um, especially having not played any of the exhibition games. Because, um, not to say that I think I understand why people were like concerned or worried or whatever, but I I think it was more about how they would approach. Um, how were they going to play him? Right. Um, we're looking at in the first game, um, USA had two players that didn't touch the court, right? In Tyrese and uh, Jason Tatum. But Tyrese you're looking right? at Tyrese Halliburton. Yes, yeah. Tyrese Halliburton. So, like, just the overall, um, what the USA is able to do is you're looking at the key um, offensive thing that they have over everybody um, is, one, obviously the NBA experience. But, look, you're looking at size, athleticism, skill at every possession and depth. Right, you're looking at other teams when <laughs> I saw one time when they sub when you sub Joel Embiid, you have Anthony Davis that comes in. So it's just like there's no Devin there's Booker almost subs no out. Deal. Anthony Edwards comes in. LeBron Andy James in, walks no. out. Jason Tatum comes in. Yeah, of course it's, mm -hmm. it's the monsters. So, so that's yeah. So that's the depth. So that's the depth going into this for sure. So um, in terms of I don't know if you, you have a couple more things that you have to see j that you want to say based on the Team USA. But um, after we kind of like wrap our heads around that, we kind of wanted to just see what are some teams that could be a threat to Team USA um, winning uh, the gold or might provide them the most um, competition. So for me, I mean, there's a reason I put Serbia in Tier 2 because I, I truly believe in the strength of that team and strength of that program. The fact that they were in group play with Team USA was going to tell me a lot about both teams, uh, specifically what would happen in a rematch scenario. And I think the Jokic stats about uh, how effective Sierra was when he was on the bench, I think that was like one indicative of like, okay, they can compete with them for sure. But I probably when push comes to shove, Joker can't play all 40 minutes. However, um, you know, you said one of the uh, one of the things you said was, um, you know, you have Anthony Davis wa walks out, uh, John beats subs out, Anthony Davis walks in. Well, that's to combat the teams with size. So that's Serbia, and that's France. And for me, France is cool. Like, those teams are, to me, are cool challengers to Team USA, but cool challengers with the right matchups. And that's why for me, Tier mm. 2 and Tier 3, like, I split them in two tiers only because I think when push comes to shove, those two teams have an extra gear because of their best players. But if they play the wrong matchups, those teams can lose in the quarterfinals. There's no doubt in my mind. Whether it's France or Serbia, they could play Australia and lose. They could play Spain and lose. They could play Team Canada and lose. They could play Greece and lose. Like, no question in my mind. Now, I think some things would have to go wrong for some and right for others, but... I wouldn't like fall off my chair if, if that was the case uh, and the center, which is why the, uh, the question about who's the best challenger to team USA is an interesting one. And I'm not sure at this time, I'm not sure. Cause I, I, I genuinely see four or five teams that all can give them, they can cause a problem somewhere. Like example, Serbia has the player that in theory team USA matches up against I think we saw it today, like, Jokic doesn't really care about, like, Team USA's defense. Like, he's going to do whatever mm -hmm. he's going to do. France, well, you would like to think that the reason they got Joel Embiid, Anthony Davis, and Bam Adebayo is that, oh, when they throw Rudy and Gobert, like, pick and rolls, like, we can switch that, we're going to be okay. Except Victor's an alien. And he's showing that at the national team level, he can still be sort of an alien. So does that big defense just not matter? Like if, from Team USA standpoint, does it not matter? Because oh, if it doesn't matter, then oh, did I mention they're the host? Like, 
some some the guys extra ten percent extra ten percent. So now you're telling me instead of two threes, we're making we're making three instead of five free throws, we're making six. Oh man, this if this thing adds up, like who knows? Team Canada, like from a mental standpoint, who I mentioned they're the team with the second most NBA players. The fear factor is completely non-existent. Non-existent. A- yeah, absolutely not. I don't care that you're bigger. I mean, Dylan Brooks exemplifies that to the highest score. Poking he's the gonna, bear. He's going to go to LeBron James right away and be like, hey, I'm so happy to see yeah. you again. Uh, <laughs> long time no see. I'm so happy to see you again. So <laughs> it, I just went through three teams, and all three of them can think to themselves, like, yeah, we can beat these guys. And then finally, for me, Team Australia, between the chemistry, the absolute altermost toughness that that team has, man, they play, again, them versus France, them versus Serbia, them versus Team USA. Do they play them in the quarters? Do they play them in the semis? All those different factors will determine who is the best matchup suited for them in the finals. It's definitely going to be an interesting uh, tournament for us to keep up. Um, it, like it's, And going back to what you said, every game matters. Every There's game matters. There's value in every single game. So like for us, it's very um, interesting. Um I think we I think we hit on everything. Is there anything else you wanted to hit on? Oh, just that it's a sight to behold to see a Victor Wembanyama, Rudy Gobert pick and roll. Like I don't like I've never I don't think that's been a thing in the history of basketball. A seven five <laughs> ball handler with seven one pick and roll partner and like the law pass is like automatic. Like I'm I'm not sure that's been recorded in the history of the game. Yeah. Like that's it's an insane thing to behold. Um and no, just from a, I mean, we haven't talked about South Sudan, um, you know, truthfully. Mm. I mean, there was a little controversy uh, this morning, a little, actually, it was a big controversy, where uh, prior to the game, obviously, the Olympics, so you played a national team of each team uh, prior to the game, and then after the game, you played the national team uh, anthem for the winner. So prior to the game, uh, the, uh, organizer, the, t- the, the game organizers played the Sudanese uh, national anthem and not the South Sudanese Uh-oh. one. And because of that, oh, a spectator rushed the court and was arrested oh, because of that in protest. It was it was not a good look, not at all. So for South Sudan to come out and win that game, there was a little extra, like you know, ma- sign juice. of disrespect, yeah. juice. Yeah, yeah. And and hmm? for what that meant nationally speaking, that was a big deal. So that does need to be mentioned. They are going to play Team USA, and after how they play in the exhibition, I don't think Team USA is going to take him lightly this time. Uh, so mm. it will be very, very uh, interesting to see uh, how they match up and what happens in that game. And if I, I mean, I'll come back to it. Uh, for, let alone as Canadians, but you mentioned it, like Canada, Greece, Spain, Australia. That's a group of death. Every game in that group is going to be an absolute war. And we illustrated how every game matters. And you could have scenarios where you get to game three with all to play for, and who knows what's on the line down in the second half, the fourth quarter, the last few minutes. It's going to be – it's an amazing tournament. We're only at day one. That's the exciting part about it. Um, we are going to be uh, definitely keeping our eyes open for different things that may happen during this tournament. But, again, Cedro, looking forward to having an amazing tournament. Appreciate you having on, and um, hopefully uh, we have a great Olympic time. We shall. We shall. We shall. Stay tuned. Stay locked in. Uh, keep watch, watch as many games as you can, people.